Hi, this is NQ35, and I'm going to go ahead and continue where I left off on uh, Sargon of Akkad. Um, in the last video, I was talking about how he claimed himself to be a Shurukin, which is a righteous ruler, and that by the grace of his god Enlil, um, he ruled from the lower sea, which is the Persian Gulf and the upper sea believed to be the Mediterranean. I'm going to go ahead and continue um, with the empires of Sargon. Now, Sargon boasted that at the wharf of Akkad he made moor ships for many distant lands. And when the scholars found this, they stood awed because they had come upon a Mesopotamian empire in the third millennium BC, which was just amazing to them. And, um, and there was a leap backwards some 2,000 years from the Assyrian Sargon of dur to Sargon of Akkad. So at first they thought, you know, it was the same Sargon, but then they're realizing that this is a completely different Sargon, Sargon of Akkad. And yet the mounds that were dug up brought to light literature and art, science and politics, commerce, um, communications, a full-fledged civilization back then. And long before uh, the appearance of Babylonia and Assyria. And so it was obvious that the predecessor and the source of the later Mesopotamian civilizations, Assyria and Babylonia, were only branches off of the Akkadian trunk. And so what I'm doing with all these videos is I'm explaining where the languages came out of and how we have um, gone backwards into time to find the source of where our language came from and, and where they actually came out of. And what's really interesting about this is in this place, in a cad near the area of Babel, which would be where Nimrod was according to the Bible, all of a sudden you'll start seeing the languages start changing. And they come from this source. Because like I said in the previous video that Assyria and Babylon never claim that language as their own. So scholars went backwards even further and found out by uh, looking up sources in the Bible because of uh, what uh, Austin Henry Layard found in his discoveries in Nineveh and all those areas. Um, they went back to the source and found Nimrod because Austin Henry Layard had found, found a land called Nimrud. So they ended up finding this place. And he would actually be equated as Nimrod. So the mystery of such an early Mesopotamian civilization deepened as inscriptions recording the achievements and genealogy of Sargon Akkad were found. And they stated that his full title was King of Akkad, King of Kish. And they explained that before he assumed the throne, he had been a counselor to the rulers of Kish and was there. Then the scholars asked themselves uh, an even earlier kingdom, that of Kish which preceded a cat. So they're like, okay, well, there's obviously this place over here. Let's go find it. And so once again, the biblical verses gained in significance. And Cush begot Nimrod. He was the first to be a hero in the land and the beginning of his kingdom, Babel and Eric and a cat. Many scholars have speculated that Sargon of Akkad 
is the biblical Nimrod. So if one reads Kish for Cush, it would see Nimrod or Nimrud was indeed preceded by Kish, as claimed by Sargon. And the scholars then began to accept literally the rest of his inscription that he defeated Uruk and tore down its wall. He was victorious in the battle with the inhabitants of Ur, and he defeated the entire territory from Lagash as far as the sea. And so was the biblical Eric identical with the Uruk of Sargon's inscription. And so at the site now called Warka, and since it was an earth, um, that was found to be the case. And the Ur referred to by Sargon is none other than the biblical Ur, the Mesopotamian birthplace of the patriarchal father of the Hebrews, Abraham. And so not only did the archaeological discoveries vindicate the biblical records, it also appears certain that there must have been kingdoms and cities and civilizations in Mesopotamia even before the third millennium BC. And the only question was now, was uh, how far back did one have to go to find the first civilized kingdom? And the key that unlocked the puzzle was yet another language. So scholars quickly realized that the names had a meaning not only in Hebrew and in the Old Testament, but throughout the ancient Near East. And all the Akkadian, Babylonian, and Assyrian names of persons and places had a meaning. But the names of the rulers that preceded Sargon of Akkad did not make sense at all, because they had names like the king at whose court Sargon was a counselor was called Urzubaba. And the king who reigned in Erech was named Lugalzagasi, and so on. And so lecturing before the Royal Asiatic Society in 1853, Sir Henry Rawlinson pointed out that such names were neither Semitic nor Indo-European, and that they seemed to belong to no known group of languages or peoples. But if names had a meaning, what was the mysterious language in which they had the meaning? And so scholars took another look at the Akkadian inscriptions, and basically the Akkadian cuneiform script was syllabic, and each sign stood for a complete syllable, ab, ba, bat, etc. Yet the script made extensive use of signs that were not phonetic syllables but conveyed the meanings God, city, country, or life, exalted, and the like. And the only possible explanation for this phenomenon was that these signs were remains of an earlier writing method which used pictographs. And so the Akkadians must have been preceded by another language that used a writing method akin to the Egyptian hieroglyphs. And so it was soon obvious that an earlier language, and not just an earlier form of writing, was involved here. And scholars found that Akkadian inscriptions and texts made extensive use of loan words borrowed intact from another language in the same way that a modern Frenchman would borrow the English word weaken. And this was especially true where scientific or technical terminology was involved and also in matters dealing with the gods and the heavens. And so what's interesting about that is that the pictographic writings, you know, having the full word and meaning the full word like man, uh, woman, and the way they were depicted to explain how they were, or like a uh, foot drawn saying go, meant to go or walk, or they would draw lines, squiggly lines, meaning water, to all of a sudden, this uh, wedge-shaped 
symbols, which ended up becoming like a ah, ba, ba, uh, you know, like confusion, like a babble. And this is really interesting because when we go back in time, we can see that the language is split during that time that the Bible is actually saying that Nimrod, with his Tower of Babel, that God had come and separated the tongues and twisted their tongues and made them confused. And then out of that land, they all started shooting out and going across the Caucasus Mountains all over. It's really interesting. <laughs> so, one of the greatest finds of Akkadian text was the ruins of a library assembled in Nineveh by Ashurbanipal. And Layard and his colleagues carted away from the site 25,000 tablets, many of which were described by the ancient scribes as copies of olden text. And a group of 23 tablets ended up with uh, the statement that said, 23rd tablet, language of Schumer, not changed. And another text bore an enigmatic statement by Ashurbanipal himself, which said, um, The God of scribes has bestowed on me the gift of the knowledge of his art. I have been initiated into the secrets of writing. I can even read the intricate tablets in Shumerian. I understand the enigmatic words in the stone carvings from the days before the flood. That is really, really interesting. That he is writing this, that he could understand the writings before the days of the flood. Well, I mean... He was obviously blessed with something. He had all these tablets in his library. He obviously knew. So the claim that Ashurbanipal said that he could read intricate tablets in Shumerian and understand the words written on the tablets from the days before the flood only increased the mystery. But in January of 1869, Jules Oper suggested to the French Society of Numismatics and Archaeology that recognition be given to the existence of a pre-Akkadian language and people. So pointing out that the early rulers of Mesopotamia proclaimed their legitimacy by taking the title King of Sumer and Akkad, he suggested that the people be called Sumerians and their land, Sumer, and that's where their name came from now. And except for mispronouncing the name, it should have been Schumer, not Sumer. Oper was actually right. So Sumer was not a mysterious distant land, but the early name for southern Mesopotamia, just as the book of Genesis had clearly stated, the royal cities of Babylon and Akkad and Erech were in the land of Shinar. And Shinar was the biblical name for Sumer. I'm going to go ahead and stop the video right here. Um, I have stopped it at one of the most ancient civilizations that they found to this day, which is Sumer. And I will continue on the next video explaining what these ancient peoples had. And um, this is fascinating history. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And I will be talking to you all soon. Hope you have a good time with this. And this is Enki 35